Welcome to the next episode of Adaptees, which again is a working title. No, it's not. Um, a new Gate Crashers, shh, a new Gate Crashers podcast segment dedicated to appreciating media adaptations in all their many forms. My name is Amanda, and my pronouns are she, her. I am John, and my pronouns are he, him. Hi, my name is Amir. My pronouns are he, him, or fucking idiot. So there you go. Whatever floats your boat. We got him back. We <laughs> we are so excited to be talking with you today about the accidental billionaires by Ben Mesrich, or as most people commonly know it, or might not even know at all, is the Social Network, which was directed by David Fincher. Um, so I have I I have been famously on record as saying that this is one of, if not my favorite movies on the planet because I am social media shill. I think this um, is also one of the movies the three of us bought it over in college. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was! Uh, this was our movie! And then we found out we all liked The Fast and the Furious. <laughs> we have two of them! Um, we have two! Um... But yeah, so very excited to talk about The Social Network, which I did not know was a adaptation of a book, probably until like three or four years later, like after the movie came out in 2010. Um, it may have even been not until I started working at Simon & Schuster when I started working with Ben Mesrich, and I was like... Is this the Facebook movie book? <laughs> All right, humble brag. You met the author. I didn't meet him. I have emailed him to be like, hey, All right, it's like send a me your stuff. Step down. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I was very surprised. Um, and so I thought this would be a really interesting one to talk about in terms of adaptations because I feel like a lot of people don't know that the social network was adapted from a book. Did did y'all know that before I told you? Amir, you want to uh, go yeah. first? Yeah, yeah. I yeah, I knew. Um I think I had read that it was being adapted and of course when Sorkin won best adapted, it was kind of just like, okay, yeah. But um I never read it. I had only ever heard of it. Um and I, it was only until you came to me and was like, hey, we're doing this episode. That I was like, cool. I, uh, this is going to be a good opportunity to read it. So um, this is the first time I've ever read it. It was this year. So, yeah. Yeah. Put that ma and pa class to work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, this is the, the fucking Google Docs is giving me tutorial flashbacks, actually. So this is. <laughs> Mir, do you want to just run past the microphone yelling, I want to be an Airborne Ranger for old time's sake? I'll do that. To, I'll, do, I'll do that at the end of the episode. Just remind me to do it. <laughs> For a good sound bite. Um, so, but yeah, I I Go, I've smattering read the book. I did not finish it. Uh, I know, professional. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> so I knew of the author. I knew it was a book because I read the author's other bi biography, and I've only read one of his other books, and it's the book about. The card counters who were MIT students, which got made into the most beloved 2000s movie, 21, which everyone remembers. Um, it was a good movie. <laughs> I have not seen it in years, but yeah, I kind of do about the movie first because they had those really great teasers where it was like, it was like Facebook statuses back before Facebook changed the meta and all that. Yeah. And it had the voiceover and everything. And I remember being like, this is the coolest shit I've ever seen. I'm in. Saw it opening night, went on a date with someone to go see it. This person hated the movie. Coincidentally, I broke up with him a week later, so. <laughs> Was it about the movie? I mean, we'll that might know. have been a part of it. Who knows? <laughs> but, yeah. Um, so, yeah. I, the book I was, I'm was i not as familiar with. Again, I'm kind of basing off one of the very few things I did read. It wasn't a lot, so I am apologies. So, I'm more. I've seen the movie countless times, though. Oh, yeah. I, like, this is one of those movies where I have watched it on loop. I have watched it with and without subtitles. I have watched every single commentary version that there is. I've watched all of the interviews and all of, like, 
the behind the scenes bullshits. I've literally read the script. <laughs> I can't, I can't put into words the kind of person I was about this movie when I was in college. <laughs> I mean, we quoted it a lot. I was extremely intense about it. <laughs> any any opportunity? You guys want to watch Social Network? Literally any opportunity to watch this. I could probably quote the entire thing. Um, it's it's truly it's one of my favorite movies in the world, and I honestly think it's largely because of the cast. Um, I really don't know if this is a movie that I would like. If I hadn't just been so like, ah, about the cast, <laughs> because it's kind of like in like the long list of like my favorite movies, this is like the outlier of like, explain this one. <laughs> I mean, I don't, yeah. I don't, go ahead, Amir. No, I was just going to say like looking at it, it's like, yeah, this is a pretty, pretty stacked cast. I mean, when you go from outside in, you got Rashida Jones. You got John Getz, who was a pretty great guy. But then you go further in. You got Jesse Eisenberg, Andrew Garfield before Spider-Man, I believe. You got This was his yeah. uh, breakout, I think. Yeah, This was he, his like big, his big like, hello, America, I, I think, exist. I think this got him <laughs> Spider-Man. Yeah, you got, you know, yeah. Brin Brenda Song, who real OG standoff <laughs> business know about Wendy <laughs> Wu, America, homecoming <laughs> warrior, yes! you know what I mean? Uh, excuse you, business. like Mike, like Mike she was in. Let's hold on. Yeah, and we millennials, we we stand for Brenda Song. <laughs> Brenda, Brenda Song, Song and her husband Kevin McAllister. We we <laughs> we love it. We love it. We love it to death. You know, Justin Timberlake playing two type, and um, we got <laughs> Madam uh, Web herself. Madam Mad Web herself. Madam oh, Webb, yeah. I love you, Dakota Johnson. <laughs> Madam Webb, go see it in theaters now. Um, and <laughs> Rooney Mara, wasn't it? Uh, Rooney Mara, yes, Queen Rooney Mara. Yeah. Um, and a cannibal. So oh, yes! good, I yes, <laughs> yes. I was hoping Literally, someone make a before, joke before you got on. Before we started recording, John was like, uh, "I don't know, should we make cannibal jokes?" And I was like. That's not something you have to tell me. That's gonna be a mirror. <laughs> no, we we gun for that. We we just go straight through the doors. With the Lone one. Ranger himself. Well, he's alone now because he don't have a career oh anymore. My oh my god! I just how scary! I don't. You know what? Sorry, Army Hammer. You did. That are you yourself. though? Like, are um, we sorry for this man though? Because I'm not. I'm not sorry for Army Hammer. I'm sorry about. Army oh, Hammer. that's fair. That's a more better one. <laughs> but yeah, so I feel like all of us came to this through like we came to the movie first. It, it wasn't yeah. it wasn't a situation where it's like I'm I'm going to read the book because I knew it existed or for whatever reason it was kind of just like no, I'm I'm going to go see the movie. Thank you. I'm moving on. And then like years later, it's like, "Oh, maybe I should Maybe I should check out the book. Um, and honestly, I I enjoyed the book. I thought it was really interesting. Um, I feel like there's a lot about the book that's kind of like really different. I like the narrative structure. I like the, the fact that it plays like a book mm -hmm. and not like, you know, uh, here are the facts. This happened, then this happened, then this happened. Like a yeah, yeah. It's it's definitely a more like creative nonfiction narration than it is like here is the timeline and history of Facebook and of Mark Zuckerberg and like that whole situation. Um, I I feel like so much of the way that book was marketed and the way that the accidental billionaires was kind of made was to be like. Hey, do you want to hear this really, really <laughs> fucked up story about some weirdos in college? <laughs> <laughs> also, these weirdos are famous now. <laughs> yeah, it's um, I, I, I think when I read it again, I had no expectations going into it, what it was going to be like. Um, I, you know, the creative nonfiction aspect of it was made it much more palatable mm -hmm. to sort of get through. Um, and it kind of reminded me of another novel I read, Masters of Doom, which kind of does that whole thing about the guys who did Doom. We did, that's another story. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, that whole aspect of just following 
and developing not only just a timeline, but like a sense of place of Harvard at this particular juncture before mm-hmm. transition. It was like, a, you know, like just a massive thing. And it doesn't shy away from college sort of behavior and thought. Like it's very like there are moments in the beginning of the novel that are very cringy um in terms of yeah. oh when you first meet eduardo in the novel and how he's just getting into the phoenix how he's oh, yeah it's that and i you know that part where and i'm glad they kept the line in the movie because it's one of my favorite lines despite how fucking cringy it is now and it's him talking about it's not like asian girls like me it's just that asian girls are attracted to like that whole bit about like asian <laughs> girls and like jewish people is like all right all right i'm not uh, whatever but um you it's know. one of those things where it's like, okay, yeah, I can, I believe that this happened. This, yep. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, college kids are fucking stupid. They'll say whatever. It's like, yeah, I get yeah. It. <laughs> yeah, or he'll do dumb shit like make a website where you rank the hotness because you were scored? Question mark. Yeah, and it's definitely like, I think something that I really like about the book and the movie and kind of just like the context surrounding it is how much everybody is like, no, this fact. And Mark Zuckerberg is like, no, it's not. It's not a fact. And we're like, you can't prove it. Mark Zuckerberg's out here (laughs) jumping in front of the screen, waving his hands around and everything, trying to be like, pay no attention to the people behind the curtain. (laughs) (laughs) Fucking alien looking motherfucker. Like I personally feel like he should be thanking the movie. (laughs) because the book like in my opinion the book kind of makes mark zuckerberg sound even more like a sociopathic robot than because that like the dip like i think if i isolate the book and just think like okay this is mesrich's portrayal of mark zuckerberg I wouldn't automatically be like, that's a sociopath. That's a robot. No, for what I but did, they made him like... put it... Yeah. Yeah, they kind of like slowly get to that point. Whereas yeah. in the movie, it's just like sociopathic robot. Automatic. I mean, I don't... But see, the thing is, I don't see him as a sociopathic robot in the movie. And I think that's because of Jesse Eisenberg. <laughs> It's because Jesse Eisenberg playing the ultimate weird little dude. Well, that's just, that's, that's everything that Jesse Eisenberg plays. I know, but this is like the ultimate weird little (laughs) dude out of every weird little dude performance he gives. He, he is, he is all, he is all universe Michael Sarah, but I do, (laughs) I, peace and love to both of them. I love them to death. Um, but I do agree with you, Amanda, in terms of, the characterization of Mark in the movie versus the book. In the book, um, which is kind of characteristic of all these creator, entrepreneur, nerd types like Bill Gates and um, uh, I'm sure there's another one. Jeff Bezos could probably count, maybe even Elon Musk. <laughs> I was just saying, do we want to count Elon Musk in that conversation? Because like, I think I think it's fair to count him, but it's just this idea that these guys are like squirrely and they're nerdy, and it's like, yeah, you know, like the nerdy guy like finally got to do the thing that was like super cool. He got back at society, blah blah blah. And then you read the book, obviously, and it's like, oh, he really just doesn't care about anyone. Like, mm-hmm. it's literally just. He wants to just do whatever the fuck he wants. He has no literal care in the world so long as it pertains to his goals, which I think the book pushes very forward compared to yeah. the movie. I And I think it says a lot because obviously when I watched the movie, I came out of it and I was the lone soldier being like, I don't think Mark's an asshole. I just think he's misunderstood. But... Then you- I literally, <laughs> Amir, literally, uh, I was a, like, okay, we should all just, disclaimer, I am, I am stan culture. Stan culture is me. The definition is my face. <laughs> but, like, I was a Mark Zuckerberg stan for <laughs> years. And, like. Yes, I am putting this out into the world. I was going to say, wait a minute. I'm pretty sure I've I've tweeted it at some point. Like, uh, uh, sue me. Sorry. (laughs) At this point, he is the least shitty billionaire. (laughs) I mean, honestly, (laughs) yeah. But like, (laughs) well, I mean, you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
He's he's the one. He's the least like, problematic and the one we hear the least about. Day. I don't have to look at your fucking face every day because you don't do something stupid every day. It's just sometimes. Um, but no, I fully came out of the movie and I was like, I love this. I <laughs> I love him. I think this was spectacular. I I and and again, I think it was just a testament to Jesse Eisenberg because I did come out of that movie sure, and the then Oscar. I did watch every single movie Jesse Eisenberg's ever been in. Right. Yeah. I And again, I get you. I, I get where you're coming <laughs> from in that regard because it's like you watch the movie compared to – because again, I'm comparing it in my brain to the book and mm-hmm. it's just like I don't want to be anywhere near Mark Zuckerberg after reading the book. But then you, yeah. you, you watch the movie – and again, one of my favorite lines that's not in the book, by the way, because again, the, the whole framing device of it is kind of a fictionalized uh, part of it, um, mm-hmm. is the lawyer during the deposition, Rashida Jones, love of my life, um, <coughs> being like, you're not an asshole, you're just trying to be. You're trying so hard to be. Was that yeah. at the end? Because I, that was the part where I was like, yeah. all right, now I'm starting to feel for that's Mark a little bit. the last line of the movie. Yeah. And so... You know, testament to Aaron Sorkin for the way he kind of navigates this book. Because, again, if you compare the two, the book is very Eduardo-focused. Very eduardo mm-hmm. forward. It's all from his perspective, I feel like. For the most part, yeah. Um, whereas the book, the movie, I should say, is very, not evenly split, but because of its framing device where it's kind of two people telling both of their sides of the story um it feels more even healed in that way Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so and i feel like so much so much of the movie feels more centralized to be about their like the relationship between mark zuckerberg and eduardo saverin and how that how that interplayed and how that affected the creation of Facebook and how the creation of Facebook affected their relationship versus like in the book, I think it was kind of just like, here is the rise and fall of this company of this, this, this situation. And here is everything else that was happening like around it. Um, because like I what the movie like, does is it really mm-hmm. serves like the pow- the strength of their friendship, and then once Sean Parker ends as a picture, that's when you see the yeah. wedge start to hit a boiling point. Until that scene in the office where yeah, he I slams think the so computer. It's the greatest scene in the movie. Yeah, that they that they bring that Sean Parker exists in both versions of this story, but in the movie, Sean is the villain. <laughs> yeah. Oh, straight up. Like he, he's like, maybe not like villain as in he is the bad guy, but like he is the antagonist. He is the thing that comes in and fucks everything up essentially. Yeah. Um, and I feel like in the book, it's a little more geared toward like, no, the reason shit goes sideways is because Mark Zuckerberg doesn't care about anything and anyone. He just cares about like what Amir said, himself and his goals and what he wants. And for me, like something that has always stuck out to me from reading the book was very specifically the scene um, after Eduardo slams the laptop and Mark has the, 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 the set of business cards. And in the movie, he takes the business cards out and he very much looks as if he's like, what have I done? Like what, what the fuck just happened? But in the book, it is cast much more in the vein of like Mark being like, ah, ha, ha, I win. <laughs> <laughs> He's Mandark. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he is. Yeah, he is. He's um <laughs> I can't even jump off that joke. That's a really good. One. Um, <laughs> but but I do. Uh, yeah, I get what you're saying with that. Um, yeah, it is. It is very much in the movie a very Osmandian sort of uh, approach downfall. To, yeah, like because again, it's not even like the the downfall of like a company, but it is very much a downfall of like the Once most in, humanity. The, yeah, yeah, not even like well, maybe to take it a step back from humanity because it's like. Mark still kind of in some way retains it, or at the very least, I would like to hope he does uh, towards the end of the movie. But 
it's it's sort of just this the most important person in his world um at that period of time that we've been led to believe was Eduardo because Eduardo was there from the beginning. So to just mm-hmm. see it sort of in that way, um, not even because of like Sean in the movie at the very least, but just because of like circumstance and because of just like, even he says in the deposition, it's just like, Oh, well you, you were a businessman and you made a shitty business deal. And it's like, that's a very crass and cold way to look at it. But mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, Mark is very much trying to be like, Hey, look, this isn't, this isn't me. You know what I mean? Like, you know, and we all, yeah. we all can obviously see through that. We can read the lines of it. Obviously, a stark contrast from the book where he very much is just like, you know, you brought this on yourself, bro. Like you read the papers, like you knew what this was about, like blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. Like this ain't got shit to do with me. Um, and you know, again, it's just, it's so interesting how he just, how Aaron just crafts that, how he just, uh, how he makes that work. So great writer, bad director. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> just need to put that out in the mix. But <laughs> is that why this movie doesn't suck? <laughs> yeah, shout out to David Fincher. There's actually, actually, just a little side tangent. But there's a story I read where um, apparently David and Aaron were going through the script before filming. And David straight up told Aaron, like, yo, you got to cut some of this dialogue. Like, there's just too much going on. I remember so. that. <laughs> that sounds like the I most David that. Fincher thing Fincher, ever. Which I think is so interesting for, like, him to say. And for I think it's so funny, the idea that there was more. Like, because I feel like the movie does make uh, an effort to... to to really emphasize negative space and to emphasize the moments where no one is saying anything and that those moments are like some of the most powerful in the movie but there's so there's so much dialogue everybody's talking all the time yeah <laughs> well it's so much dialogue and, like, and want, then they were going to talk more <laughs> mix that with fincher's perfectionism cuz the man is a perfectionist that opening scene was 99 takes yeah. Yeah. I remember that. I've I remember hearing that, but Jesus. That. And oh. I'm just like, what? <laughs> oh, David, we we love you. But also, just to just to hijack off of that, just the opening scene, which again, classic, all timer, one of the one of the greatest opening scenes of any movie that I've seen, contemporary wise. Um, I was stunningly shocked after reading the book that Rooney Mara's character is more or less a. Not fabrication, but it, she doesn't appear in the book in the way that we. No, I, I was shocked She's about like, that. Supposedly, like an amalgamation of just like woman. <laughs> right. Yeah, and <laughs> she is just girl. <laughs> and I thought that was a really smart way to sort of bring in that sort of aspect of Mark Zuckerberg, him being this squirrely proto incel type where it's sort of just like he doesn't know how to talk to women he doesn't under like because in the book it's a little bit more insidious in the book because he only ever the only times you ever really see or read about mark with a woman is he's either fucking them in a bathroom or he's dating a victoria's secret model or just some background person that he's hanging around with. That's mm-hmm. it. That's it. That's that's the only interactions we ever see with him. So to have that sort of play into his character in the movie, that kind of sets the whole thing up, I think is a very interesting way to show that he's kind of out of depth, not just with people, but, you know, with women as well, you know, compared, yeah. you know, compared to Eduardo, who has much greater success um, in both the novel and in the movie. So. Yeah, I I really I really love how in the book, like even though it, it it does kind of skew more toward Eduardo and and his perception of events, he's for whatever reason feels so much more like like a human that I could like mm. in the movie than he does in the book. Right. And I just think it's really interesting that, like, even in a narrative that is being framed in favor of somebody, I'm like, I still don't like you. <laughs> <laughs> no. 
He definitely is not someone I'd want to get a drink with. He's, you know... I think there's very few characters in this movie, Ed Book, that I would want to be like, let's go hang out. Let's do something. (laughs) Amanda. Uh, Listen. (laughs) (laughs) I want to get a drink with most of them. The characters or the actors? <laughs> See, they, they 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 just meld together. This is what I'm saying. This is why I like this movie so much. It's because I genuinely forget that they are acting. <laughs> yeah, Andrew Garfield has a very like just I found regular out Andrew dude. Garfield was British, and I was like, huh? <laughs> what? <laughs> And then also, I was like, wait, isn't this guy supposed to be Brazilian? But never mind. <laughs> a- Andrew Garfield is Brazilian in that movie the same way Al Pacino is Cuban in Scarface. So. Yeah. <laughs> That's the way we look at it. <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, you know, again, oh. shout out Brenda Song because she's, again, National treasure. She, the people's princess. Um, she went harder than anybody else in that movie. I don't care. I, like, yeah, I, she, she's the runaway she in that movie. Like Twenty minutes of screen time, and she said, "You're gonna remember me." <laughs> I, I, I'm also. I, I also thought it was very funny. First of all, Eduardo is weak. I would have dated a crazy girlfriend for the rest of my life. Um, <laughs> second of all, um, we discussed that before, bitch, Mir, you and I. <laughs> This is you know, look. That's a skill issue. I'm sorry. You just you know, get your way up. But, um, no, but I also I also thought it was very interesting how just that particular relationship. Um, how in the novel he's pretty much just like God. She's, she's crazy girlfriends. Ha ha. Shrug. Um, and then she ends up burning down. Like I, I can't remember if it was like the college dorm or the apartment or like something. But like the entire place gets like torched. Whereas just in the movie, it's um a trash bin on a bed mm-hmm. and it alludes to the the idea that the entire place goes up in flames um which again you know so hey look listen that's uh it's really hot honestly literally um <laughs> so um, brenda song i would let you burn down my house yeah please please call me um <laughs> it would be the sweet this, life wouldn't it I, i'm free this fuck you all right <laughs> <laughs> Hmm. I'm, not, I'm not sorry. I'm not sorry. <laughs> boo this man. <laughs> Stone and boo this man. Tar, Incredible. Tar and feather him. Amazing. Um, but yeah, I think so even beyond like some of the differences and, and some of the things that I like about the movie, I think one of the things that like maybe puts the movie to just like such a higher level for me was just the soundtrack okay i was gonna be like we're not leaving this recording before we're bringing up the score sir we we cannot ignore the soundtrack that i listened to on a loop to do my very late papers in college (laughs) <laughs> Trent Reznor like, and Atticus Ross coming out what, the gate. What a fucking banger of a soundtrack. Was this their like, first film score? Yes, <laughs> this was their first film score. Yeah. Fuck. I This is I think this soundtrack was the first time ever in the history of me watching movies where I was like, I'm going to go listen to this thing that doesn't have words. <laughs> <laughs> I, and like, I would listen to it on a loop. Hand covers bruise is one of my favorite pieces oh. of sound. <laughs> like every time I think of that song, I think of the scene in the office where he finds out his shares have been diluted. AKA one of the it's greatest just... scenes in cinema, just the music, that song especially. But uh, they're in the Hall of the Mountain King cover is kind of sick too. In the Hall of the Mountain King when the, during during the, the rowing. during the rowing. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah. Fucking iconic. And then they lose. Let me tell you something. 2010 <laughs> was a heck of a time for bands slash techno slash artists to just go into film scores between this and Daft Punk. 
Yeah, shout out Daft Punk doing uh, Tron Legacy real quick, just just the one time. Um, no, yeah, the 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 score is pure magic. I don't think up to that point I had heard anything quite like it. Um, and this is obviously like obviously you've heard electronic scores before. You know, John, uh, you know, Van Vangelis and. Blade Runner is like a massive yeah. big deal for a lot of people. Tangerine Dream um, for so many and Thief. Right. Ta yeah. Tangerine Dream and Thief. And, you know, like these scores are, are very big. It's, it's not a new thing to make electronic score. But there's something about the way that Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross make and craft not even just music, but soundscapes that just complement ominous feelings about this movie like the whole movie has a very that first track i like i, I believe his hand covers bruise is yeah. so ominous that you wouldn't think that it would be linked to a movie like this you would think it would be for like a horror movie or something like that yeah and i think yeah and i think that misdirection is so good for the movie um and it sets the tone too like i remember i think that's i think you hear that in the opening credits after rooney mara breaks up with him Right, yeah, and you're yeah. just and you're just like, okay, something bad's gonna happen. And you look you at just, Harvard, and it's like makes it so so foreboding, and just not even just not even just foreboding, but just lonely. Like I think of that image of like him running back to the dorm, and he passes by just a guy practicing violin or viola or whatever sh stringed instrument, and it's just him by himself. And I think that really sets the the vibe of what's of what's going on here. Um, and, you know, again, the next track in motion, which by the way, I just need to say, um, very interesting of them to have actually shown us what the quote unquote fuck truck was. Uh, <laughs> 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 in the movie, I just kept hearing that, that phrase in the novel was like, Oh, right. Yeah. This is, yeah, okay. Yeah, college. Got it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Get Actually, it is funny. I, I was thinking about this. You are mentioning the loneliness and handcuffs before we move on here. Um, in that scene with the shares being diluted, when you hear that play after Sean and... Or not Sean. Um, well, Sean's there. Uh, Eduardo and mark are fighting about this and i feel like that's kind of right there showing like mark's about to become that lonely guy again it's the reprise <laughs> <laughs> it's like oh something bad's gonna happen yeah no um it's a great score i i wish i could buy it on vinyl but i can't find it anywhere but that's neither here nor there um yeah it's 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 fantastic it's one of the best scores i'm glad they gave it best original score at the Academy Awards, and um, when it should have won others, should have won Best Picture. Uh, well, you, there's still a chance, but <laughs> <laughs> listen, I think I think we are at a point where we can take Tom Hooper's Oscar back and give it to David Fincher. <sighs> at least for Cats. Um, <laughs> Based on that yeah, alone, I, he should be able to take, get an Oscar taken away from David by David Fincher. Bruh, I think I've been living in a world where they did win. Because <laughs> I'm, I embarrassed, embarrassed myself. <laughs> That's really it's because a because you you being like like John being like it should have won Best Picture. I'm sitting here like it didn't. No, it was the King's <laughs> Speech. God damn it, Daniel Day Lewis. <laughs> no, Colin Firth. God damn it, Colin Firth. Daniel Day Lewis was Abraham Lincoln. Yes, yes, he was. <laughs> shout, yeah. out Day, shout out Dale D. Lewis. Real, 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 <laughs> Come real back, kick, we miss you. Real king shit right there, you know? <laughs> Amir, I just put something in the group chat. I just found uh, Social Network on vinyl for you from the Nine Inch Nail store. Oh, well, don't mind if I pay for that later um <laughs> but, but, but what what do you mean these men were in nine inch nails oh yeah they're oh. from what what do you mean um yes yeah, what, so, what what do you mean did you not know this <laughs> no i 
just learned this just now on the Wikipedia. <laughs> All right. Well, well yeah. Well, let's not. Let's. They're not. It's not that they were in Nine Inch Nails. They are Nine Inch Nails. <laughs> well, all right. Well, hold. They. Well, hold on. Wait. Well, hold on. Wait a minute. <laughs> um, Trent, <laughs> hold on. Wait a minute. <laughs> Trent, Trent Reznor was the front man of Nine Inch Nails. Atticus Ross didn't come in until a little bit later. Um, Apparently, 2016. Yeah. 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 So. Um, but yeah, yeah, no, no, Trent Reznor has always, he's actually been making scores very subtly for a while now. He did the music for the video game Quake back in like the early nineties. And, uh, I think he commissioned, I think he did original music for the opening of seven with David Fincher, which is how they initially met. So, um, yeah, no, Trent's been at it for a while now, but this is like the first time a full movie he decided to do something so um, that's wild and like it's definitely it's definitely not a situation for me where i'm like what do you mean that they could do this it's more of a what what do you mean that these are the same sound people. making people <laughs> <laughs> same people did that did the fucking ninja turtles Explain. movie Shout out to Ninja Turtles, shout it. out to Watchmen. Amazing. Wow, I learned I learned something new every day. Now, <laughs> um, I do want to ask a question, because since this movie came out, a lot's happened to Facebook since this movie has come out. Yes. If would you want a sequel if you no. get the original people back? No. Okay. Um See, I've thought about this. Um and the answer is probably going to have to be a no, a soft no. I'd have to, you would have to tell me in depth what you are going to explore in that movie. Yeah, because there's a lot. I just, I just, I just don't think that, that there is a way to talk about the years after and still keep any kind of humanity in it, honestly. Unless you go, um, like, the Steve Jobs route and you do, like, three different sections. Unless you go the Steve Jobs route and you do two movies and you go, <laughs> pick one. Um, <laughs> Knowledge the Apple too, Steve. <laughs> but, yeah, I think I, it really, really, really heavily depends on, like, even what, it, what they're going to focus on and how they're going to do it because, like, what... I think I think I've made it very clear that the thing I love about this movie is the people mm -hmm. and the way that the people are being portrayed as both like flawed and as people who like had close relationships and like their decisions had adverse effects on these relationships and let's look at how this relationship deteriorated and why you'd have to find something like that. And put it in the movie. Yeah. And I don't know where you're going to get that. Yeah, yeah, I feel like you'd have to have a damn justifiable reason to come back. Like, I I would mind if you got those three back together, either for this project or something else entirely, like Eisenberg, Sorkin, Fincher. I'd be fine with that. But if you're going to do, like, a Facebook social network to social network boogaloo... um, then I think you would have to need to, like you said, I, do, I would need to hear in depth what your plan is to order to yeah. justify this. I, you, yeah. would, you would need a really good human element. Yeah, I think, and this is just me, this, this is screenwriter brain talking, so forgive mm -hmm. me. Um, I know nothing, I'm not talented, I, I, you know, I can't write for shit. Yes, you are. Shut, shut, the it. Uh, shut the fuck up. Uh, yes, you shut. are. What are words? <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I would say, I would say an interesting... And again, I don't want this, by the way, because just because what we know about Mark Zuckerberg now, I don't I don't need another movie about a billionaire living a life. You know what I mean? Like, that's just I don't yeah. need it. Yeah, I just, it, it does nothing for me. But if they were to go forward with that whole aspect, it would probably have to focus on him actually getting married and it would have to focus on that relationship. And like this yeah. idea of like this contrast of, um, oh, he finally found love. And he's finally learning how to deal with that. And he's finally learning how to maintain that. Meanwhile, Facebook is Ooh. off the rails. And that's all coming apart. Like, like, show his marriage while all this is going on in the background? 
Yeah, because, you know, the way the social network is is framed and worked um, is that in order for Facebook to become a thing, he has to lose an important relationship in his life. And that's Eduardo. In order for him in this hypothetical sequel, in order for him to have this relationship and this marriage work, Facebook kind of has to fall to the background. That's the only way you can make that kind of work as two movies. Um, and I don't think people are going to be interested in that particular aspect of it mm-hmm. because no one cares about billionaires falling in love in that way. Like, it's just not. Yeah. It's not this a- is something it, this is something that would have had to, like, come out immediately after. Yeah. The social network, because, like, mm-hmm. at this point, like 14 years later, too much shit has gone down with Facebook as the catalyst and with Mark Zuckerberg as the catalyst. Like, if if this movie did not come out in 2010 and, like, you said, hey, there's a Facebook movie coming out and it's 2024, everybody would be like, fucking so? Like, mm-hmm. who wants that? No one wants that. And, I it, like, I think that's, like, part of the reason why the movie was even successful in the first place. It's because it came out at a point where people were like, tell me more. I want to know more about this secret little man. Yeah, because I was like, (laughs) a Facebook movie. I guess we're really doing everything as a movie. Okay. And then I saw that teaser trailer. I'm like, oh, wait, never mind. This looks good. Yeah. It's like... It's like, yes, tell me how that happened, because you're clearly framing it as something that was, like, dramatic and traumatic. And it's kind of like, if MySpace Bill had, like, (laughs) a really dramatic finding of MySpace. (laughs) But no, I don't, I don't think, I don't think a sequel would yeah. Work out. I would maybe read a book. If Mesrich like, wrote another book, you mean? If Mes- if Mesrich wanted to write another book being like from 2006 until today, I'd be like, yeah, I'd read that. But I don't know if I would watch that. Right. Because I feel like they're two very different. It, it, like, at least to me, like, the act of reading something and of watching something are two very different experiences. Because, like, when I'm reading something... I feel like I am taking the information into my brain and it's kind of just like going into a box and I'm like, okay, I'm done. Versus like, I watch a movie and then I tattoo it into my brain. (laughs) (laughs) And like, I can repeat it on a loop. Um, Which is something that I, I find that I can't really do with books so i don't i don't want it to be on a loop if it's not going to be fun for me right (laughs) right that's fair but it would be interesting um and i think it's i think it's something that would be really cool again if it was like 10 years ago (laughs) Yeah, I, I think that's the other thing, too, is a lot's happened, and I think the time at this point has passed. At this point, I think they'd have to have two. I, they'd have to split it into, like, two or three movies. Or you just do, like, because, a, like, a limited series. Yeah, because, like, realistically, the the Accidental Billionaires covers, like, three years? I think, like, Maybe? while all this shit's going <laughs> on, if, if you do do it, while this shit's going on, you just come back to Andrew Garfield, he's just chilling on a beach somewhere, just having the time of his life. Eduardo Saverin's just chilling. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew Garfield, what are you up to, a man? He, does, he gives that weird face he gave at the Oscars, where he's like... I, I don't know, buddy. I'm, I'm, I'm not dating Emma Stone, I can tell you that. No idea. No. Yeah. R.I.P. <laughs> R.I.P. to that. Um, but John, I see you have some fun facts here. Please regale oh, me. Oh, did I? I forget that I had some fun facts. I didn't know what I had written down. Hang on. Your your Sean Parker fun fact. Oh yeah, where did I? Hang on, let me get that up. Hold on. I. <laughs> it's the film yeah. of Napster. Yeah. So 
Sean Parker, originally not going to be played by Justin Timberlake. Um, Jonah Hill was going to play him. But David Fincher said no. I just, I don't know, I don't know. This, I don't know. This would have been two years after Super Bad Jonah Hill. Right, and that puts it into a context where I'm like, why? That's why I'm like, <laughs> we, we, we weren't there with Jonah Hill yet. I don't think we ever would be, but we're not, we weren't like... It's not, yeah. it's not Moneyball Jonah Hill. Yeah, I feel like if Moneyball and Wolf of Wall Street had already happened, that would have made more sense. I would have been like, oh, okay, I can maybe see it. Yeah. Um, you know, at this point in the world, both Jonah Hill and Justin Timberlake suck. So <laughs> they both work. <laughs> Wild that this, is, that this is the movie that got Justin Timberlake to get... This is a movie. This is a movie that was like, "Hey, yeah, the suit and tie music video exists because of this movie." Yeah, I mean, L- uh, listen, he plays a paranoid jackass very well because he is a paranoid jackass. <laughs> justice for Britney. What? Justice for uh, J- Janet Jackson. Yeah, that, that too. too. Mm. Stand, standing on business for that one. Um, yeah, I mean, Jonah Hill. Look, I, I've I've always felt Jonah Hill was a capable actor, regardless of how stupid he is now these days. But um, you know, he's he- I just but I just feel like at that moment in time, it's like if you looked at what he had done at that point, I would have been like, I'm confusion. Yeah, I mean it definitely would have been a shock, but I see why this was a thing. I I can see why mm-hmm. he was attempting to do that i can see that he was trying to shake that sort of fat guy comedy image he wanted to do something serious i don't i don't think this would have been a good fit for him i think justin timberlake was perfect for this role i can't imagine anyone else being this role other than justin timberlake um who is such a skis um he plays (laughs) slimy really well (laughs) so well (laughs) <laughs> which is which is I think very funny to me because I feel like everyone in the movie compared to the novel got softened down maybe just like a little bit and then Sean Parker is like one to one. He got he was, <laughs> literally they were like no this is a crazy bitch and he needs to stay a crazy bitch. It's, <laughs> he is he is a psycho he is crazy um he is he brought minors to his party at the end. Which I just want to say, throughout the entirety of the social network, we've been led to believe that Sean Parker is a skis, so that when he does get to the party and he gets busted with underage people, it's not that much of a surprise. I was no. very much surprised in the novel when we finally got there, because at that point it was like, oh yeah, he's just kind of like a weird guy that I don't really want to yeah. be around. But Mark idolizes him for what he does, and I guess I get why the two of them like each other. And then you get to that section where it's like, yeah, they could have been underage. And I was like, oh. (laughs) Yeah, I just, it's so wild. Like, I think, like, to the credit of the movie, it has sort of the space to jump around in timelines and setting and, you know, all of these different um, spaces in a way that's, like, a little more difficult to do in a book because, like, in a book, you don't necessarily have, like, the cues that you have in a movie, such as, like, music changing or costuming or color grading or, like any of like you don't have any of that in a book you kind of just have like what is what are the words on the page and have you told me what year i'm in or where i am um and if that's like information that you don't catch then you're more easily confused about what the fuck is going on and so like most books to 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 the benefit of the reader tend to be like very linear or at the very least very easy to follow beat by beat whereas like i feel like this movie is just like now we're here and then we're there and now we're here and then we're there but it's not difficult to follow and so i think because of that the way that fincher constructed the movie you get those opportunities to be like 
oh, like Sean is a fucking creep and you can get that early because you're not disrupting the flow of the novel. Right. right. Yeah. To yeah. show it. So like like getting to getting to that point, getting to the party in the movie, you're like, yeah, I expected that versus like, like even at that Amir, first what meeting about getting to that point in the book. Even you're at like, that huh? first meeting with all of you got the vibe. And then when you, I mean, that was a funny line but when he says drop the the. Those the way he said it. Just Clean. the way he said it. I was like <laughs> to, to drop the the. It's clean. <laughs> and then Mark is in the car. And he's like, I've never, oh never related genius. to Eduardo more in my life than just being like, yeah, fuck that guy. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Eduardo, Eduardo was like, right all along. Eduardo said the vibes are bad. <laughs> and Mark said, okay, I hear you, but hear me out. <laughs> hear me out and then doesn't say anything. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Just, just an incredibly, a, a, a wildly bad judge of character. It's so fun. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. loved it. Like he's like, you know what? I'm gonna clown on the Winklevosses because I can, just because, and no other reason. And then, like a year later, he's like, oh my god, Sean Parker, I love you. Like what? Huh? <laughs> How does that make sense, sir? <laughs> Fucking Winkle I love this movie. This movie is wild. And like every time I watch it, I catch something else. <laughs> like, I'm not gonna read the book again. It's like it's one of those things where I was like, thank you for the information. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's definitely not something I feel like I need to to read again now that, like, I've done it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's very much a, again, look, listen, I uh, for those for those playing at home, uh, I would just like to make a mention and say that uh, the day where we were supposed to initially do this interview uh, or um, <laughs> podcast, I should say. Um, I speed read it two hours before we were supposed to, <laughs> to be. Um, <laughs> so I just, I just want to point that out that I'm going off of memory off of a two hour read, but um, you know, like you, you go through it. It's a very easy read, by the way, it's very yeah. quick, but um, it's a good book. Like yeah. I, I think it's fascinating. It's, um, it's just not necessary to like, you know, you got the information, then that's that's it. Like you know. Yeah, but. I definitely think like this is one of the the situations in like a book to movie adaptation kind of way, um, or vice versa, where I'm like, I think. You could go your whole life and not read the book and like not miss anything. Um, but I do think that reading the book kind of gives a lot of interesting flavor and context to the movie. Um, like this is honestly like I could probably continue to talk about the movie for another hour and like considering the three of us have been talking about this movie for 10 years is yeah. saying a lot. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um. And it's just, I feel like if if you're gonna do only one, I think you should go watch the movie. But if you're down to do both, I think you're gonna have a good time reading the book, because... Ben is pretty dece. Ben is a fun guy. Um, but yeah, what if you guys if you guys could only do one, should I just assume that it's going yes. to be the movie? Like we're pretty yeah it, it's, here. again, I didn't finished reading the book, so I can't comment on that, but so I'm very biased here, but yeah, it's the movie a hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, the book the book is great. The book yeah. offers up so many so many details that you're not going to get in the movie. 
Um, but if I had to sustain myself off of this particular story, um, it probably would have to be the movie. I mean, just because the movie gives us so much more and is better for it. Um, again, you don't get Rooney Mara in the novel. You don't get the deposition and the sort of like he said, sh- he said sort of, uh, framing device. You don't get Rashida mm-hmm. Jones. You don't. <laughs> I just love Rashida Jones. Uh, you don't get the score. You don't get the cinematography. You don't get um, the the in the Hall of the Mountain King rowing section. You know uh, what I mean? Um, you you don't you don't get Jesse Eisenberg and Andrew Garfield being one of the most iconic on screen duos that I'd ever seen in my life. Right? Incredible. You know you don't get. <laughs> You don't get the 800 million fan fiction. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, we'll just, oh, no, 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 don't, don't. There's don't. so much. <laughs> there is so much fanfic, and Amir, you cannot stop me from saying it. There's fanfic about Tetris. There's fanfic about Pong. Of course there's fanfic about this movie. <laughs> um. I wasn't gonna let it go. <laughs> There's just <laughs> you don't get the fanfic. You, you don't get the fi- wait <laughs> to quote this movie's tagline. You don't get the 500 million fanfics without making a few enemies. There you go. There you go. <laughs> oh, man. Um, but yeah, no, the movie is just it, and it, it just it's a it's a great. It's a, in, in the words of Martin Scorsese, it's a great picture. You know what I mean? Like, it's a great it's, picture, it's, he says. It, it just, it just is, you know? Like, and I trust Scorsese on all things, including his views on Marvel, which are theme park rides. I had to get that in there real quick because I haven't been here in a very long time. Fuck Marvel. <laughs> fuck the MCU. Just real quick. I had to say that. Uh, but yeah, the movie is, is, um, is is fantastic so if you have to choose one i would say go for go for the, yeah go for the movie. and if you want to watch the movie it is available dvd blu-ray wherever you find those things in your life um you could also like rent it support physical um, support physical probably. media forever Support physical media because the streaming services are the devil and they're deleting everything. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you can find the DVD and the Blu-ray pretty easily. Like we mentioned anywhere, last week, like we mentioned with Percy Jackson, you can find <laughs> it anywhere. You can find it. Um, and if you want to read the book, go to your library. I highly suggest going to your local library. So support but your small libraries. bookshops. Yeah. Yes. Um, but also, it is likely available in any place that you can buy a book. Yeah, um, yeah. Go so, to go to your local yeah. Borders, and they'll probably have <laughs> Amir, it. Amir, I got bad somewhere. news. I got bad news uh, to tell don't, you. Don't, don't fucking make tell. Me, stop. Don't, don't make me think about Borders. <laughs> border. Get your get your nice little coffee. Go shop some books at Borders. It's a great time. It's a great. I it's think Barnes and Noble killed Borders. Get your, get your Seattle coffee. Get your Seattle coffee at Borders. <laughs> <laughs> I miss you. Um, we can't let this episode go without our favorite line. Yeah, okay. John, Do you want me? I, I mean, I don't know if I'd be able to yell, but <clears throat> <clears throat> sorry, my brother's at the cleaners, along with my hoodie and my. <laughs> <laughs> along with my hoodie and my fucking. You pretentious douchebag. <laughs> Douchebag! I love you guys. What a film. <laughs> love you guys love y'all too. too. Thank you for doing this <laughs> one with me. No, of course. Absolutely. Wouldn't miss this for the world. <laughs> Bye, friends. We're going to stop recording now. Yeah. I want to be in that Ranger. <laughs> I want to get in that Ranger. <laughs> All right, good night, guys. Love you all. Love all. <laughs> <laughs>